Yes, we do. Somebody's going to have to tell me if this is a disaster and that I have grossly overestimated my ability to broadcast audio. Um, so if y'all could say something as soon as you uh, hear me or see me, <laughs> that'd be great. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Kat. That's very, very helpful. Um, also good to know what the lag is like. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, welcome to Liz and Friends Read A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Uh, I really appreciate everybody joining. I know that it is a little bit of a weird time, both for people who are in the Western Hemisphere right now having to deal with it being the middle of a workday and people in other parts of the world having to deal with the fact that it is late in the evening. So I just wanted to give a quick hi and thank you for uh, joining in. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction and then I'm going to read a little bit of the afterword from the book, the edition that I have of A Christmas Carol, and then uh, we'll move into 
reading the text itself with the guests and uh, myself at various times. So I will start with a few notes that I've made just as a preamble to make sure that everybody knows that this is a good, safe, comfortable space as well as what to expect from the live stream going forward. So uh, to start, I will say um, I wrote this down so that I didn't forget anything. Um, so forgive me if it sounds a little stilted or if it doesn't make sense. I hope that it does. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I really appreciate all of your uh, patience and I just wanted to absolutely make sure that we were all on the same page before we started. So if my thing will load, there we go. Uh, last year I kind of created this video interpretation which included some home videos, some original footage, and some archival footage from uh, all of these different sources to do a story time of a child's Christmas in Wales and I loved doing that so much it made me so happy it's one of my absolute favorite Christmas stories so I'm happy now to be able to share another story time with you and I have to give credit to my spouse who had the idea both of making it a live stream as well as a charity fundraiser so thanks Archie um, they're going to be reading actually with me a little bit later in the day so I'm excited for that a couple of you are big Archie fans so that's gonna be really cute uh, this year we're changing the format, but we're keeping up that storytelling tradition with the live stream and I hope that you enjoy it just as much. A few notes before we get started. First things first, I expect generosity and civility towards me, my readers, and other viewers on the channel. Uh, each of us has a personal perspective as it relates to this story and it's important to recognize that they're all valid. This story has words, phrases, ideas, and observations which do not necessarily align with my values or those of my fellow readers, and I'll allow them discretion to comment or not as they see fit. Uh, this is a group of readers that has a variety of faiths and backgrounds who each find value and joy in this story despite its flaws, of which they are all keenly aware. So history is inherently problematic and a pinch of salt ought always to be applied. Please keep that in mind. I will not tolerate any abuse in the chat or in comments uh, on behalf of my fellow readers, myself, or the viewers. This is a no tolerance space for that kind of thing, so just so that you're warned. Additionally, this is an English story, and while each of the readers today are native English speakers, none of them are from England, and the text is nearly two centuries old. So we are far-flung inhabitants of the colonies or neighboring countries, and we may from time to time pronounce words a little bit differently from how you might say them, or how they would have been said at the time that the story was written. Uh, we're not professional audiobook narrators, and this is meant to be a fun story time to benefit charity, so please give us a little bit of forgiveness in that respect. Um, we will be reading the entire text of A Christmas Carol, but Please do not expect a smooth, seamless audiobook style running. Um, this is a space where we're going to be editorializing, commenting, joking, and going on tangents to share our thoughts and maybe even selections from other stories or poems and other things uh, that we feel will enrich your experience. Um, if you want a straightforward audiobook experience, may I recommend the Audible exclusive by Tim Curry doing the reading, which is excellent. If you need a free version, there is a free version on LibriVox.org, or uh, there is a <laughs> abridged version, which is my personal favorite, uh, which is narrated by Orson Welles, and Scrooge is played by Lionel Barrymore. I found that on vinyl a few years ago, and it is choice. Um, and then, before I move on, I also uh, will make the first of many mentions of the charity that we are raising money for. Um, I chose the Global Hunger Project because I felt that their goals were especially pertinent to the themes of the Christmas Carol story. Uh, the Hunger Project is an international charitable organization whose efforts at reducing food scarcity and insecurity are focused on mobilizing local communities, especially women. And they recognize the futility of a top-down approach when it comes to uh, making lasting change in impoverished communities. Communities know what they need, and giving them access to the resources and channels necessary is a much more sustainable process than giving them what we think they need. And, um, oh, I lost my place. Oh, yes, okay. Um, so, with all of that said, I humbly ask that you make a contribution to the charity GoFundMe fundraiser to benefit the Hunger Project. 
You'll be able to find uh, the link in the description as soon as I'm done this intro, if I haven't added it already to the description. I'm a little frazzled this morning, but also the QR code that will link you to the GoFundMe page should be visible on the screen at all times during this live stream, with maybe one or two exceptions depending on how the layouts worked out. I don't at the moment recall. Um, donations are open currently, and they will be open until the end of day on December 26th, so if you're not catching this live, you might still have a couple of days to donate, and I'd be really, really grateful if you could do that. Uh, GoFundMe charity mo the GoFundMe charity model means that at no point will the donations be accessible to me or any of the other readers. It will be contributed directly to the Hunger Project after this uh, fundraiser closes out. So don't worry about this being a process where you think that you're giving money to charity, but actually you're just secretly giving it to me. That's not what's happening here. Also, this video is not monetized. I will not be getting any revenue from any source for this video. It's important that I reiterate that. If you've, if you've heard me say it already, that's because I really want to emphasize that it is extremely important. <laughs> um, all right, so yes, fundraiser is open until the end of day on December 26th. When I say end of day, I'm referring roughly to midnight Pacific time, uh, although I'm sure that uh, that can be uh, flexible if somebody message me, messages me and is desperately like, I can't, I would get paid until the 27th, help! Like, g allow yourself some grace, but message me if the 26th isn't going to work for you, but you really want to donate. Um, that's all fine. Also, don't feel as if you have to donate if it is not in your budget to do so. I completely understand that this is an especially uh, penny-crunching time of the year, and it is especially difficult in the last couple of years. So if you cannot donate, please share, uh, explain to friends and family on social media, what have you, that this is something that we're doing uh, in order to benefit the Hunger Project, and you can share the links and etc. I'd really appreciate it. <sighs> All of that said, and thank you for joining. I'm seeing people who are uh, so sweet, uh, and I really appreciate everybody telling me how much they like the various things. Um, <laughs> this this strip at the bottom is an accident. It's not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be for when uh, Sarah is reading. No, no, wait. For yes, this is when I'm supposed to be reading later during reading of Save Three. But I'm glad that you're all enjoying it now. <laughs> Um, all right, all of that said, uh, I'm going to start off reading the afterword of my personal copy of A Christmas Carol, written by Anna South. Then we're going to have a quick break so I can iron out some tech stuff, and then uh, Jimmy will be joining us uh, to take up the beginning of the tale, which is very exciting. So um, I'll, uh, I'll be doing that in just a moment. You may have noticed there are some other elements on the screen with me. Um, the rotating images are from the variety of illustrators who illustrated early editions of A Christmas Carol, specifically uh, John Leach, who was the original illustrator on the original edition. Uh, his are the very scratchy uh, ones that are black. I'll show some maybe when I have my copy later. And the other one is Arthur Rackham, who illustrated another edition that we have that Archie will be reading from. And uh, then there are also interchanged in there some images of a prompt copy that D Dickens had. Dickens was very interested in having this be a performance piece, and so carried around a annotated version where he had struck out a bunch of the descriptive passages in order to make a more fluid performing copy, essentially. And I think this is one of the reasons why it is such an adaptable piece of media and why there are so many different movie adaptations and stage adaptations and ballet adaptations and etc is because Charles Dickens really did from the beginning intend to perform it and performed it himself hundreds of times and so uh, there are also scans of his annotated copy and there are also some fun facts about the passages and about the uh, about the fellow himself in the writing of this particular um, story so I hope you enjoy all of those extra bits every reader also will have on the screen the little um, a, a profile icon that I've put there so that if you don't know who these people are when they're reading, if you're enjoying their reading, you can also check out their YouTubes and their TikToks and their Instagrams and whatever else I've, uh, I've put up there. Again, if I remember, I'll add it to the description. It's been a bit of a hectic time, but neither here nor there. I really appreciate uh, how much 
how much all all the work everybody put into it. So I want everybody to uh, to check them out because they're awesome people outside of this particular story time as well. Um, between each reader, I will also have a short five to ten minute break. This is to help with the transitions and also to help with the tech stuff. And because I'm not insane and know that uh, people need breaks from live streams too, because this is going to be quite a long one. At my current estimation, I'm going to guess that it's going to take at least four hours. It will probably be more, uh, just for the record. Um, yes, okay. Uh, yes, last note, uh, the word staves in this context refers to the chapter separations that Charles Dickens uh, wrote in the A Christmas Carol, and that is due to the fact that he is punning sort of on the fact that a Christmas Carol, being a song or a poem, would have stanzas or staves instead of chapters. And he actually continued that in a couple of other short stories that he did for Christmas. The Cricket in the Hearth has chirps instead of chapters, and uh, the Chimes story has uh, chimes. First chimes, second chimes, etc. So I think that's really fun. If you'll excuse me a moment, I have left my copy on the table behind the camera. I will be right back. I'm so graceful. So seamless, what I've done here. All right. So the afterword um, was written by Anna South and is delightful. I'm not going to read it in its entirety, just on the basis that a lot of it has to do also with the, uh, with the other chapters and the other uh, stories that are in this particular copy that I have. But I just wanted to especially read a little bit of the end which I really appreciate and I think is, uh, is really sweet. Um, and it's just in re regards to uh, how the transitions of, of Scrooge are, are so pertinent, I guess, to even our contemporary sensibilities. <sighs> Where did it go? As with several of Dickens' work of full-length fiction, a concern to raise public awareness of the terrible plight of the poor and the hungry forties lies at the very heart of A Christmas Carol. The tale may be a source of entertainment, but it is also a source of instruction, a vehicle through which Dickens can express his outrage at the terrible poverty and suffering of the poor. While, Scrooge we first meet, may, while the Scrooge that we first meet may have been a great believer in the union workhouses which came into existence as a result of the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834, Dickens saw only the cruelty in their breaking of the human spirit and fracturing of the all-important family unit. While the solidarity of the Cratchit family is exemplary, quote, they were happy, grateful, pleased with one, uh, one another and contented at that time, it is also terrifyingly fragile. Their financial well-being is, is inextricably linked to the whims of Scrooge as Bob's employer, and their poverty is equated with the powerlessness in the face of Tiny Tim's physical plight. But it is the second spirit who delivers the most blistering attack on social injustice and its many evils, prophesying the calamity arising from neglect and rupture of both the social and Christian contracts in This Boy is Ignorance, This Girl is Want, Beware of Them Both and, beware of them both and All of Their Degree, quote, the two wretched children clinging to the spirit's garments are grotesquely de deformed and tainted by poverty and suffering, a living indictment of a society's dereliction of duty. Scrooge's appalled response to them, a man to whom human life was previously cheap, is not worthless, is further magnified by his horror when he later sees a dead man's corp corpse being robbed of the shirt off his back. Like the children, this man has been abandoned and is alone and uncared for, but the revealing of its identity to be uh, deals Scrooge a double blow. In the spirit ha 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 sorry, in the spirit that has best has the best learned lessons that are those hardest learnt. I'm not sure what that sentence is meant to say. I apologize. I'm not reading it again. That was dreadful. He may not have realized whose body lay beneath the calico shroud when he first saw it, but we certainly did. And herein lies the great joy of a Christmas Carol. It includes and involves us at every turn. It challenges as it entertains, and delight even as it appalls. Most of all, it exemplifies Dickens' great strength for offering his readers an all-embracing fictional experience, one that is both superbly amusing, however par how remember how partial Old Scrooge was to darkness on account of its being cheap, and heart-reddingly sad, 
Picture the forgotten young Scrooge, alone in an empty classroom. Playful flippancy sits alongside scalding social criticism, depictions of forces for good alongside those of institutional and individual evil. While Dickens' Christmas tales may have captured the spirit and sensibilities of the Victorian age, they remain timeless in their appeal to the modern reader, not only for their nostalgia value, but for the many, but for the ways in which they are grounded in reality. Fiction may be strange, and the Dickens, pre and Dickens predilection for supernatural elements falls into this category, but reality certainly provides some great inspiration. And that is the end of the uh, afterword that uh, Anna South wrote for my particular issue of edition, rather, of A Christmas Carol, uh, which is the Collector's Library edition, which uh, or fam people familiar with my uh, videos might recognize that this edition is also what I own a lot of my classics in. I like it quite a bit. Um, so with that, I really appreciate all of y'all's patience. We're going to take a quick break, and then when, we back, when we're back, hopefully, if all goes well in terms of the tech, uh, Jimmy will be joining us. So I'll see you all in a moment.
SWB audio capture, not registered. SWB audio capture, not registered.
everybody. Uh, due to, to some unexpected troubles beaming in our resident Welshman, uh, we are, uh, I am going to be taking over, uh, reading the first bit of the first stave, uh, until I am, uh, interrupted, uh, to have your original reader join us. I'm Archie Sargent, I am Liz's spouse extraordinaire, uh, and I have been told that in spite of the fact that it has only been about half an hour that we've been on stream or so, we have already raised $130 for Project Hunger. Magnificent. Feliz Navidad. We've done it at last. Uh, we solved hunger. Congratulations, everyone. And we'll do it more soon with the help of your donations. Uh, and with that, I will be getting started on stave one of... A Christmas Tale. <laughs> a Christmas Carol. First thing I say, I literally get the title of the book wrong. Stave One of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Marley's Ghost. Marley was dead, to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of the burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade, but wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will, therefore, permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral, and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There's no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am about to relate. If we were not per perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say St. Paul's Ch Churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood. Years afterwards, after the above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley, the firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret, self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows, and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about him. He iced his office in the dog days, and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Christmas. External heat and the cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry win weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitter than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. 
Foulweather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only a one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones call nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was a cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it is quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and the candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense that without uh, was so dense without that, although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door, the door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in, I'm sorry, as soon as the clerk came in with the shovel, correct pronunciation, is something that Liz has explicitly said will not be in this stream. <laughs> and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore, the clerk put, clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself with a candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge, Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you been to me? What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? We're poor enough. Come then, said the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer, ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with, Humbug! Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be? returned the uncle. When I live in such a world of fools as this, Merry Christmas, out upon Merry Christmas, what's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money, a time for finding yourself a year older and not now a richer, a time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a hundred dozen of months presented dead against you? If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, 
every idiot who goes about with a Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew. But you don't keep it. Then let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you, much good it has ever done you. There are things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it was come round, apart from the uh, veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time, a kind, a forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave, and not just another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see them. Yes, indeed, he did. He went the whole length of the, dis of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, cried Scrooge's uncle, nephew, why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing one <laughs> sorry. Growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. It, just to clarify for anyone who is confused by that truly wacky statement above, Scrooge has said that he will not come to Christmas dinner, in spite of the fact that it being a, 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 a 19th century novel, he was completely incapable of saying it in a direct way and used, if I'm not mistaken, a truly marvelous triple negative. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if Scrooge as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. A good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never come to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been party, but I have made the trial in homage but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a happy new year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, and a wife and family talking about a merry Christmas, and retire to Bedlam. This lunatic in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were partly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, 
said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago, this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, present, pre presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and the destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. There are plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses? demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Ah, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish it to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself about Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those that are badly off must go there. Many can't go there and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. And besides, excuse me, I don't know what. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself, and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring lengths, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street, at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes, and had lighted a great fire in the brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing suddenly congealed and turned to a misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops, where holly sprigs and fairies crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, in which it was poss impossible 
to believe that such a, such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in, his strong, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet, and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But, at the first sound of, God bless ye merry gentlemen, may not think you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffled his candle out and put on his hat. You want tomorrow? Eh. <laughs> I have a cold if you haven't noticed, but uh, it's really contributing to my Scrooge noises. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly, and yet, and yet, the wreath is falling off from my head. I'm sorry, everyone. I have to uncostume. Oh. That's much better. And festive. Look, it's an improvement. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comfor comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill at the end of the lane of boys twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all of the newspapers, and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms, in a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with the other houses, and had forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, and the other rooms being all let out offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. Now. It is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it, night and morning, 
during his whole residence in that place. Also, that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation, aldermen, and the livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face! Marley's face! It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked to Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That, and its livid color, made it horrible, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a uh, part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood, not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy, would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause, with a moment's irresolution, before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door, except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Pooh, pooh! and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above, and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below, appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door, and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach, and six up a good old flight of stairs, or through a bad young act of parliament. But I mean to say, you might have got a hearse up that staircase, and taken it broadwise, with a splinter bar towards the wall, and the door towards the balustrades, and done it easy. There was plenty of width for that, and room to spare, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you might suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face. His, uh... Sorry. Momentary technical difficulties. Are we back on? Hang on. You're still visible, you're just not audible. All right. I've been told that we're back on audio after a momentary problem, uh, which was your wonderful host knocking the microphone off of the table. Um, but she's fine. She's doing a great job. A magnificent job, may I say. Built a pretty sturdy fire, too. This is not fake. <laughs> this is not This is not trickery. This is a real-ass fire. Oh, wait. Uh, sorry, I'm not allowed to say story words. That referred to a donkey. Let's move on. Incidentally, we had a conversation about the fact that Charles Dickens includes some very naughty jokes in this, and yet I'm still not allowed to swear on stream. So if there is any other words for donkey used, it's not my fault. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that, dark, for that. 
Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. Small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious altitude upon the attitude upon the wall. Lumber room as usual. Old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed. Nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it. Before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel, the fireplace was an old one built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles, designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Belshazzar's, apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts. You know that face of Marley, Seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod, and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Humbug, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that, as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun altogether. They were succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and when he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door, Is humbug still? said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy open door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him! It's Marley's ghost! And fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, though Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but 
He had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through, he saw it standing before him. Though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold dyes, and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous, and fought against his senses. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. Caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. How were you then? said Scrooge, raising his voice. Your particular per shade. He was going to say to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? Asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that, in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. "'You don't believe in me?' observed the ghost. "'I don't,' said Scrooge. "'What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your own senses?' "'I don't know,' said Scrooge. "'Why do you doubt your senses?' "'Because,' said Scrooge, "'a little thing affects them. A "'Slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. "'You might be an undigested bit of beef, rod of mustard, "'a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. "'There's more of the gravy than of the grave about you, whatever you are.' Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is, he tried to be smart, as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit staring at those fixed, glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play, Scrooge felt, the very deuce with him. There was something very awful, too, in the spectre's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of his own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case, for though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as by the hot vapor from an oven. "'You see this toothpick?' said Scrooge, returning lead to the charge for the reason just assigned, and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. I do. I do, replied the ghost. You're not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Hamburg, I tell you, Hamburg. At this the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round his head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must, but why do spirits walk the earth? Why do they come to me? 
It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide and if that spirit goes not forth in life it is condemned to do so after death it is doomed to wander through the world oh woe is me and witness what i cannot share but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness again the spectre raised a cry and shook its chain, and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Uh, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link, and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Ah, oh, would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself. It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly. Oh, Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would a very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Oh! It was a habit with Scrooge, whenever he became thoughtful, to put his hands on in his breeches pockets, pondering, and what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed in a business-like manner, though with humility and deference. Slow, the ghost repeated, seven years dead mused Scrooge, and traveling all the time. The whole time, said the ghost. No rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry and clanked his chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. Oh, captive bound and double ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by a lot of creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, walking kindly in, this, in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you were... Always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. 
the dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raised them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob, pray. How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his bow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and a hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank ye. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is that the chance and hope that you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. Yeah, I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. It couldn't, couldn't I take him all at once and uh, have it over, Jacob? hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. That was literally a clip from the Alistair Sim version uh, from 1951, which, by the way, is the greatest film version of all time. Liz has it pulled up at the moment. And uh, we will be doing a, a uh, screening in our household on Christmas Eve, as we always do. When it had said these words, the specter took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made, when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did, when they, were, when they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for, on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of a confused noise in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings in inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory self-accusatory voices. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in their mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity, and looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in a restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. 
many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them was all, all was clear, eh, the misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say a humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, hum, and being from the emotions he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep on the instant. Stave one complete. Just a sec, just a sec, hush. Nonsense. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do now. So <laughs> you're I'll good, you're good. I'll, I'll be, back on. I'm coming over. <laughs> and then. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, this is not staying on for even a moment. Okay. Um, uh, my apologies. Uh, some stuff has gone wrong. We're not able to get Jimmy on the live stream. I'm so sorry, everybody who is looking forward to uh, seeing uh, Jimmy doing the reading. Um, my apologies. We're, we're doing our best, but, you know, time zones and tech and all of this stuff, it gets in the way of a lot of this stuff. So my apologies. Thank you so much, Archie, for taking over in the last minute. That was my very pleasure, sweet Internet. of you. Um, nice to meet everyone. <laughs> and um, we're going to take another short break, uh, at which time everybody can have a rest and uh, use the washroom and all of that fun stuff. And then uh, Grant also was not able to join us live, but uh, luckily knew that far enough in advance uh, that he was able to send a pre-recorded uh, portion. He is going to be reading Stave 2. And so uh, please enjoy that. That will be playing automatically after the break. Um, if there are any issues with audio, please let me know. Um, I will be monitoring the chat and things like that. So uh, please uh, keep us posted, but hopefully everything will knock on wood, run smoothly. Um, in the meantime, uh, enjoy a short break and uh, we'll talk to you guys in a minute. Oh, shoot, one more thing. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Grant edited this together himself. I added only a little bit of an intro for the smooth running of things, but everything else he put together. So thank you so much, Grant, for putting in all of that work and effort ahead of time. Very much appreciated. It's really good. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about it. I hope Scrooge is going to be okay. Sit down. I can. Well, do it then. You don't believe in me. <laughs> I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. 
The slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You, you might be an undigested bit of beef. <laughs> a piece of cheese. A fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave in you. Whatever you are. Do you see that toothpick? I do. You're not looking at it. But I see it notwithstanding. Oh. Well then, I've, I've just got to swallow this and I'd be tortured for the rest of my life by a legion of hobgoblins. <laughs> all of my own creation. It's all humbug, I tell you. <laughs> Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I do, I do, I do. I must. But why do you walk the earth? And why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. If it goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. <laughs> Cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Why are you fit out? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on to my own. Yes. More bread. Take me extra, sir. No more bread. Yes. Sit down. I can. Well, do it then. You don't believe in me. <laughs> I don't. 
Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You, you might be an undigested bit of beef. <laughs> a piece of cheese. A fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave in you. Whatever you are. Do you see that toothpick? I do. You're not looking at it. But I see it notwithstanding. Oh. Well then, I've, I've just got to swallow this and I'd be tortured for the rest of my life by a legion of hobgoblins. <laughs> all of my own creation. It's all humbug, I tell you. <laughs> Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I do, I do, I do. I must. But why? Hey guys, happy holidays. It's Sizzent here. And the holiday that we're going to be talking about today is Christmas. And what we're going to be reading is, of course, A Christmas Carol. This, um... This isn't A Christmas Carol. This is an old book on the history of leather crafting, but I thought it made a nice prop and looks a little bit nicer for that opening shot than my tablet, which I'll actually be reading off of. Due to the nature of time zones and the vast world that we live in, sadly, I'm joining you in a pre-recorded fashion, but... I hope that you'll allow that because of time zones. It is five o'clock somewhere, so cheers, and I hope that you're enjoying a lovely end of year. Now then, A Christmas Carol, Stave Two, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that, looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavouring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters. So, he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on from six to seven, and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Which, I believe, is the nature of numbers. One does follow the other. Twelve! It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have got into the works. Twelve? He touched the spring of his repeater to correct this most preposterous clock. Its rapid little pulse beat twelve and stopped. Why, it isn't possible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything, and could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold, and that there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day and taken possession of the world. This was a great relief, because three days after sight of this first of exchange pay to Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge or his order, and so forth, would have become a mere United States security, if there were no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavoured not to think, the more he thought. And I mean like, hashtag mood, like, is Scrooge a millennial? Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again like a strong spring released to its first position, and presented the same problem to be worked all through. Was it a dream, 
or not. Scrooge lay in this state until the chime had gone three quarters more when he remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. I mean, like, I'm just throwing it out there that, like, if a ghost had warned me that another ghost was going to come and visit me, I and had given me, like, a specific, like, like, an appointment for when the ghost would rock up, I kind of feel like if I were this anxious that I couldn't stop thinking about the same thing like Scrooge, <laughs> what a huge if, right? That's crazy. But, like, I would probably be doing nothing but stewing over what time it was and how soon it was until my ghostly appointment. But uh, Scrooge has other things on his mind, evidently. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past. And, considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length, it broke upon his listening ear. Ding dong. I don't know how to articulate that because it's like, do I try and strike the same tone as a clock might or do I simply just read it a little bit more flat because we all sort of get the idea of what a clock sounds like. Maybe I can edit. Maybe I can edit a clock sound in later. Editing Grant, can we get a clock sound? All right. Ding dong. A quarter past, said Scrooge, counting. Ding dong. Half past, said Scrooge. Ding dong, a quarter to it, said Scrooge. Ding dong, the hour itself, said Scrooge triumphantly, and nothing else. You can really tell that he was getting paid by the word, right? He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close to it as I am now to you. Close in the sense of the focusing of the camera. I'm in Australia, so presumably most of the watcher base is American, so um, quite far, really, all things considered. And I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet most delicately formed were, like those upper members, bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. Oh, how lovely! There's a shout-out to Australian Christmas in here. I'm touched. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light by which all of this was visible and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which it now held under its arm. Even this though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality, for as its belt sparkled and glittered, now in one part and now in another, and what was light one instant at another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And... In the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Yeah, dog, I think that is the strangest quality. I feel like 
I feel like Dickens has somewhat buried the lead on the qualities of this spirit. Um, why even mention... Why even mention the weird hair and weird arms? I feel like you could lead with the fact that sometimes there are twenty of them. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? Asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if, instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. No. Your past. Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why, if anybody would have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in its cap and begged him to be covered. What? exclaimed the ghost. Would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow? Scrooge reverently disclaimed all intention to offend or any knowledge of having willfully bonneted the spirit at any period of his life. Can we bring that back? I have never bonneted any spirits. He then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conducive to that end. Scrooge, a man is ever after my own heart. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, Your reclamation, then. Take heed. It put out its strong hand as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, and that he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at the time. God, Scrooge really going for the Johns here. Like, Scrooge absolutely just... You're literally being visited by a ghost, and he's like, mm, I've got, I do have a bit of a sniffle. Although, to his credit, this is stuff that he isn't saying, so carry on. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but, finding that the spirit made toward the window, clasped its robe in supplication. I am a mortal! Scrooge remonstrated, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an empty country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold, wintry day with the snow upon the ground. Good heaven, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. I'm really not nailing like one definitive voice for Scrooge. So, um, you know, apologies. <laughs> The spirit gazed upon him mildly. Its gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present in the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odours floating through the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling, said the ghost. And what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered, with an unusual catching in his voice that it was a pimple and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. You recollect the way? inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge with fervour. I could walk it blindfolded. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. I do kind of like... I'm just throwing it out there. If I were a ghost and it was my remit to visit Scrooge and like fuck with him, I I would be a little bit catty, you know? Like I would 
I would I would call Scrooge out like just a just a little bit. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs who called to other boys in country gigs and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. The jocund, jocund, jocund. Is it like a, is it meant to be like a silent J? Jocund? No, that sounds like a brand of probiotic. The jocund travelers came on and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads and byways for their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, what good had it ever done him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it. And he sobbed. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little leather cock surmounted cupola upon the roof and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. For the spacious offices were little used. Their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken and their gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more attentive of its ancient state within, for, entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold, and vast. There was an earthly savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candlelight, and not too much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made barer still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he had used to be. Not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the panelling, not a drip from the half-thwarted water spout in the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leafless boughs of one despondent poplar, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not the clicking in the fire that fell upon the heart of Scrooge with softening influence and gave free a passage to his tears. The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. Suddenly, a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading by the bridle an ass laden with wood. Why, it's Ali Baba, Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. It's dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time, just like that. Poor boy. And Valentine, said Scrooge. And his wild brother Orson, there they go. And what's his name? Who was put down in his drawers asleep at the gate of Damascus. Don't you see him? And the Sultan's groom, turned upside down by the genie. Genie? Jenai? 
I think it's plural, Janai. And the Sultan's groom turned upside down by the Janai. There, he is upon his head. Serve him right. I'm glad of it. What business had he being married to the princess? To hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature upon such subjects in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying to see his heightened and excited face would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. There's the parrot, cried Scrooge, green body and yellow tail, with a thing like lettuce growing out the top of his head. There he is, poor Robinson Crusoe, he called himself when he came home again after sailing round the island. Poor Robinson Crusoe, where have you been? Robinson Crusoe. The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. That was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Hello, hello. Then, with a rapidity of transition, very foreign to his usual character, he said, in pity for his former self, Poor boy. And cried again. I wish... Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about himself and drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, Let's see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. Of course, we know that it is through the uh, magic of fiction. That was mean. He knew only that it was quite correct that everything had happened so that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost and, with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously toward the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and put her arms about his neck and, often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, dear brother. I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said the girl, clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh, to bring you home, home, home. Home, little Fran returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimful of glee. Home for good and all, home for ever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be that hope's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you, and you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes. And you're never to come back here, but first we're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. You are quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being so little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness toward the door and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there. And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condensation and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. He then conveyed... Do you mind? I'm reading. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlour that was that ever was seen, where the maps upon the wall and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows were waxy with cold. Here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered instalments of those dainties to the young people, at the same time sending out a meagre serpent to offer a glass of something to 
to the postboy who answered that he thanked the gentleman. But if it was the same tap as he had tasted before, he had rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk being by this time tied onto the top of the chaise, the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and, getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the hoar-frosted snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost. But she had a large heart. So she had, cried Scrooge. You're right. I will not gainsay its spirit, God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost, your nephew. Scrooge became uneasy in his mind and answered briefly, yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again, but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great extravagant, Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. Ah, excellent. It's giving me a lot of direction here. <clears throat> Yo-ho there, Ebenezer, dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly and accompanied by his fellow prentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick, poor Dick. Dear, dear. <clears throat> Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight, Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how these two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had them up in their places. Four, five, six, barred them and pinned them. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hilly ho! cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with a wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, dick, cheery up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, the fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the young six followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of not having bought enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door, but no one who was proved to have ever had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly. Some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling in, they all came, anyhow and every how. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way. 
down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping, old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, well done, and the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter especially provided for that purpose. Honestly, sounds pretty good to me. I'm, uh, I'm glistening. I'm not sweating. I'm glistening. Thank you. But, scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home, exhausted, on a shutter, and he were a brand new man, resolved to beat him out of sight, or perish. There were more dancers, and there were forfeits, and more dancers, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog, mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told it him, struck up. Sir Roger de Coverley. I'm not familiar, but, um, presumably a fashionable piece of music. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple two with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with. People who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they would have been twice as many, ah, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them. And so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back to your place. Fezziwig cut. Cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and, shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self, he corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed him to listen to the two apprentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig and when he had done so, said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit, he has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil, say that his power lies in words and looks in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add up and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives us is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. 
Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of his life. Just gonna, just gonna pause there for no, <clears throat> no real reason. Just um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> his face had not the heart and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of a growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, and in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly, to you. Very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? He rejoined. The golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you, have I not? What then, he retorted, even if I have grown so much wiser, then what? I am not changed toward you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How open and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough. That I have thought of it, and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope is its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness upon him. Tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Ah, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself, but he said with a struggle, You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows, when I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who, 
in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may, and the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream, from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy with the life you've chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why did you delight to torture me? But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, now a comely matron sitting opposite of her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count, and unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, they were not forty children conducting themselves like one, but every child was conducting itself like forty. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in with the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them, though I never could have been so rude? No, no. I wouldn't, for the wealth of all the world, have crushed that braided hair and torn it down. And for the precious little shoe, I wouldn't have plucked it off. God bless my soul to save my life. As to measuring her waist in sport as they did, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for punishment and never come straight again. And yet, I should have dearly liked, I own, to have touched her lips. To have questioned her she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes, and never raise a blush, to let loose waves of hair, an inch of which would be a keepsake beyond price. In short, I would have liked, I do confess, to have the slightest license of a child, and yet to have been man enough to know its value. By now, a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she, with laughing face and plundered dress, was borne toward it in the center of a flustered and boisterous group, just in time to greet the father, who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenseless porter the scaling him with chairs for ladders, to dive into his pockets, to spoil him of brown paper parcels. See, there's no need for fancy wrapping, all right? Fancy wrapping is historically inaccurate. You heard it here first. I'll die on this hill. <clears throat> Hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round the neck, pummel his back, and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received. The terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into his mouth and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm, the joy and gratitude and ecstasy, they are all indescribable alike. 
It is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions go out of the parlour and, by one stair at a time, up to the top of the house where they went to bed and so subsided. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever, when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside, and when he thought that such another creature quite as graceful and as full of promise might have called him father, and being a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I tut, don't I know? She added in the same breath, laughing as she laughed. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear, and there he sat alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you that these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which, in some strange way, there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if it can be called a struggle, in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its own past, was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary. Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap, and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form, but Though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and, further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. It's not quite as impactful to just tap the lock button on a tablet, so if you'll allow me. Thank you so much for joining me for stave two of A Christmas Carol, and thank you so much for joining all of us for all of the staves of A Christmas Carol. I really hope that you guys are enjoying the experience and I do hope that my co-readers are having a very merry holidays indeed. From my house to yours, happy holidays. And may none of us be haunted by the terrifying ghosts of the past Christmases that have befallen us. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the story picks up from memory. I'm really sad that I couldn't join the rest of you guys, but you know, Time zones are what they are, and December is what it is, so I'm going to stop recording now because I've left myself a very short amount of time to actually edit this and get it all ready before I have to go and visit family for the festive season. So if that's what you, dear viewer, are doing, I do wish you all due safety and haste in your travels, and if you're staying home for the holidays or even not celebrating any holidays at all, I do hope that you enjoy a very pleasant December, whether you are in the Northern Hemisphere where garb like this might be a little bit more suitable or whether you're sweating down here in Australia with me. Hey Google, what's the weather like today? Yeah, it's uh... We've had a lot of 30 degree days with a lot of cloud cover, so rest assured that I'm absolutely sweating myself to death in this three piece suit. Anyway, all of this to say, cheers and happy holidays. Why? Because it is at Christmas time that want is most keenly felt. 
and abundance rejoices. Uh, what can I put you down for? <laughs> Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you asked me what I wish, sir, that is my answer. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. And some would rather die. <sighs> if they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, it's not my business. Isn't it, sir? No. It is enough for a man to understand his own business without interfering with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Who's that? Your nephew, Uncle. That's you, is it? Well, what do you want? Neither to borrow money or beg a mortgage, Uncle. Only to wish you a Merry Christmas. Keep Christmas in your own way and leave me to keep it in mine. <laughs> but you don't keep it. Then let me leave it alone, then. Much good may do you to keep it. Much good it has ever done you. It certainly done me no harm. No, your way with nature has done that. And your marriage? My marriage was the making of me. The ruin of you, you mean? Why don't you come and see for yourself, if you won't take my word for it? Come and dine with us tomorrow. No, thank you. But why? Why? Why did you marry against my wishes? Because I fell in love. You fell in love with a woman as penniless as yourself. Oh, good evening. <laughs> We've never had any quarrel that I've ever been party to. I ask nothing of you. I came here in the spirit of right goodwill, and I won't let you dampen it. So a Merry Christmas to you anyway, Uncle. Good evening. And a Happy New Year. Good evening. Humbert! How is Mrs. Cratchit and all the small assorted Cratchits? Very well, sir, thank you. All champing at the bit for Christmas to begin, eh? Oh, yes, sir. All very eager. And the little lame boy, which one is he? Oh, Tim, sir. That's right. How is he? Oh, we're in high hopes. He's getting better, sir. Good. A Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, sir, and a Merry Christmas to you, sir, I'm sure. Thank you. You want the whole day off tomorrow, I suppose? If quite convenient, it's sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I stopped you half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, wouldn't you? Hmm? But you don't think me ill-used if I pay a day's wages for no work, do you? Hmm? It is only once a year, sir. It's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Yes, sir. I'm sure I'm very sorry, sir, to cause you such an inconvenience. It's the family more than me, sir. They put their hearts into Christmas, as it were, sir. Yes, and put their hands into my pocket, as it were, sir. 
Uh, I suppose you better the whole day. I'll be back all the earlier next morning. I will indeed, sir. Thank you, sir. It's more than generous of you, sir. Yes, I know it is. You don't have to tell me. Merry Christmas, sir. A Merry Christmas, sir. You, a clerk, and 15 shillings a week with a wife and a family, talking about a Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'll retire to Bedlam. Sir. No more bread. Yes.
hopefully that's hopefully that's working <laughs> sorry everybody technical issues okay okay good oh good lord i'm so sorry all right thank you everybody for your patience uh this has been a minute um, but hopefully we're uh, we're getting on good time. Fabulous. All right. So uh, thank you so much, Grant, for that. That was spectacular and so much fun to listen to when I first received it. I genuinely forgot that it was going to be broadcast to multiple people and kind of had a little moment of like, oh, what a nice little thing to be listening to is just Grant reading me a story. And yeah, then it turned out that that's actually, it's actually for other people. So I'm glad you all got to enjoy it too. That was pretty spectacular. All right, so I will be reading stave three, which is the second of the three spirits. Uh, this is commonly uh, known as the ghost of Christmas present. So uh, there are a couple things that I'll sort of editorialize as we go, but I am happy that everybody is still here and enjoying it. Fantastic. All right, so stave three, the second of the three spirits. Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding a conference with the second mes messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder of which of his curtains this new specter would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands, and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, did not wish to be taken by surprise, and made nervous. I love this, like, preemptive anxiety. That he's just, you know, I'm already anxious. I don't want to feel any more anxious. I don't want to be surprised. Surprise is the bad part. That's, yeah, that relatable. I feel that, Scrooge. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter. Pitch and toss is a, is a betting game of combination of skill and luck. Between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite heartily as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was given with a violent fit of trembling. He was taken with a violent fit of trembling, excuse me. Five minutes? Ten minutes? A quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All, all this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and center of the blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant, or would be at, and was, something apprehens and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at that very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. Um, this, at this part, we come to a point that I think Grant had very, uh, very shrewdly made in the previous chapter, which is to say, I think we all know exactly what we would do, and it's always what Scrooge wouldn't, and we always know what Scrooge doesn't. And, uh, Dickens makes this point. At last, however, he began to think, as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person who is not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too, I, at last I say that he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, upon further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and in, shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green, and it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened, the crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney all that, as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, 
or for any many, many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim from their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a gl <clears throat> excuse me. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high to shed its light upon Scrooge as he came peeping around the corner. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the ghost, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. He was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an ancient scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. Um, for the record, <laughs> Archie's costume from earlier when they read Stave 1 uh, was actually going to be uh, part of their helping me read Stave 3, but their swooping in at Stave 1, which we're very appreciative of, meant that it was a slightly anachronistic, but nevertheless extremely delightful costume. <laughs> You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these later years. Sorry, the camera's just, the display of the camera's just turned off, so give me just a sec. Strange. Okay, we're back. I wonder if it actually turned off at that point. Anyways. <laughs> um, I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many spir brothers, Spirit? <laughs> More than 1,800, said the ghost. Arch is informing me that the camera never turned off just the display, which makes me embarrassed, but that's fine. More than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. Sorry, that's the dog. I went forth last night on compulsion and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. What a command. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, puddings, fruit, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood upon the streets of Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it come plumping down into the road below and splitting into a, a thousand artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough, and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been plowed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a great shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate of the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain. 
For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, now and then exchanging a facetious snowball, better-natured missile by far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great, round, pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like waistcoats of old gentlemen, lolling at the doors hum and tumbling out into the street of their, in their ap apoplectic opulence. Sorry, ap apoplectic opulence is a great phrase. There, there were ruddy, brown-faced, broad girth Spanish onions shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shelves in wanted slyness at the girls as they went by, and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. See, even the onions in this story are perverts. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from the conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankled deep through the withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squat and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. Oh my god, they sound so good. Norfolk biffins, I think, are one of the things that is being described in the, in the ticker text below, and oh my god, they sound so delicious. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race, appeared to know that there was something going on, and to a fish went grasping round and round in their world in slow, passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers, nearly closed with perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps such glimpses. It was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with malt and sugar as to make the coldest onlookers feel faint and subsequently bilious. I don't know if that's a good thing, Dickens. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress and the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the full promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humor possible, while the grocer and his friend, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished, polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection and for Christmas daws to peck at if they chose. Uh, for Dawes to peck at a heart is a reference to Othello, just for the record. Uh, and Dawes are jackdaws. They're similar to, like, magpies and crows. Like, they're birds. Um, but soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And at the same time there emerged from scores of by streets, lane and nameless turnings innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in the baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on the, their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day. And so it was, God love it, so it was. In time, the bells ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and there was genial shadowing forth of all these dinners and progress of their cooking in the, blotched, in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavor in what you sprinkle on the torch? Oh, sorry, from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is, said the ghost, my own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge to any kindly given, to a poor one most of all. Why to a poor one most, asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. 
Spirit, said Scrooge after a moment's thought, I wonder if you, of all beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often, only, often the only day of which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. It, it has been done in your name, or at least the name of your family. Uh, Scrooge, uh, by the way, confusing the ghost of Christmas present apparently with Christ or God. All right. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who would do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that, and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Hey, there's something that's a bit of a takeaway, uh, a, a little uh, pull quote, if you will, from this particular text. Uh, I feel like that's something that we could think of in all respects of this particular passage. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible, as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath the low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure of the good spirit had shown off Sorry. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding up his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled, and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself, and pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Um, Bob being a shorthand term for uh, what uh, Bob earns in money, shillings being Bob. Uh, I, I hope that was clear. Otherwise, that was nonsense. I'm sorry. I'm going to take a quick sip of tea, and I think I might have to build up the fire just a moment. Uh, so I'm going to take a pause really quick to add a log. Just a moment here. You get to see the shame that is the back of my gown. It is not a completed gown. It was done very quickly, which is why I am hiding it beneath a blanket. that's all settled once again. Let's keep going. Lost my place. There we go. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork in the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, 
came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onions. These young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. I'm just thinking of the prospect of peeling boiled potatoes, and it's not like they were going to wait for them to cool down very long, so oof, that sounds unpleasant. What has ever got your precious father, then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't, let, <laughs> weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the young two Cratchits. Hurrah, there is such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, you're late. How late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and tearing off her shawl and bonnet for, uh, for her with officious zeal. We'd a great deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and we had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless you. No, no, here's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down upon him. Comforter, by the way, in this case in Victorian England, meaning a long scarf. Um, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse, racehorse, all the way home from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day. I love that the two young Cratchit's idea of a joke is to suggest that their child would be forced to remain in a milliner's workshop over Christmas Day, despite likely not being paid for the work. And... Yeah, that's their idea of what's funny. I think that there's something very Dickensian in that statement. Um, Martha, who uh, is in sympathy with me, didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke. So he came out so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. It's a vat of water that would be used for washing with boiling liquid. Made of iron at this point, not copper, but formerly made of copper, thus the name. And how did little Tim behave, asked Mrs. Cratchit, when she rallied Bob with his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much, and he thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in church, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Um, for those who don't actually know the reference, if you don't celebrate Christmas or if you have not actually uh, understood your Bible stories, the reference is that Jesus Christ performed the kinds of miracles that allowed beggars to walk and blind men to see. And it's Im intimating that Tiny Tim is sort of thinking of himself as a martyr of making people think of Jesus when they see him because Jesus would have healed him. It's an odd thing for a child to say, which is why it is being emphasized here. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cups, as if, poor fellow, he were capable of making them more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, stirred it round and round, and put it into the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they returned soon in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like that in this house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor, Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, and Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table, 
the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for lest they, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose about, around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There was never such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, its size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as, Mrs. Uh, indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't eat, ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the young Cratchits in their, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. For those of you who aren't familiar with how a uh, Christmas pudding is cooked, it is cooked in a ceramic dish, sort of a cake-like thing, and then it's wrapped in cheesecloth and boiled all to, all, all to kingdom come. And as a result, uh, it can be very fiddly when it comes to turning it out because it'll, it'll, it'll stick in the like pudding container or it'll have broken up or something like that. So it's, it's a very nerve wracking experience, uh, especially if maybe you have inferior ingredients or using a new recipe or something to that effect. And of course, in the times before we had uh, the control that we have in, in fire and in boiling things, uh, it was a lot more of a uh, trial and error process. So that's why she's nervous. Suppose it could not be done enough. Suppose it would break in the turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the garden while the garden over the wall in the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out in the copper. A smell like washing day because of the boiling water. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next, to, next door to each other with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed, but smiling proudly, with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half a half quarter of ignited brandy, it's like an eighth of a shot, and bedight with Christmas holly in, on the top. What a wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought that it had been at all a small pudding for such a large family, or it would have been flat heresy to do so in the Cratchit house, and he Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, the fire made up, and the compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovel of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called the circle, meaning half a one, and Bob Cratchit's elbow stood, excuse me, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. This is the extent of the glass objects that aren't stoneware or something else in the Cratchit household. That's what's being intimated there. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served, out with beaming, served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, a Merry Christmas all to my dears, God bless us. To which the family re-echoed, God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. For the record, this was described earlier as basically just like gin and fruit mash, and this is what he's just doling out to his children. Um, I'm assuming it's either watered down significantly or that, you know, these kids just have the hearty fortitude to take gin, um, but who knows? <laughs> Maybe he's just getting his kids hammered. Uh, <laughs> he sat very close, Tiny Tim sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool, Bob held his withered hand, little hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. 
I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Oh no, said Scrooge, oh no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. Well, what then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing it the, on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and trembling cast eyes upon the ground, but he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the, the children. Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day? I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas, and a happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had had no heartiness. Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care tuppence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, there were ten time, they were ten times merrier than before, to the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them that he had a situation in his eye for, Pe for Master Peter, who would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire between his collars, as if he were deliberating on, that, on the particular investments he would favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good, long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. And also how she had seen countless, oh, sorry, also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, as at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you would have seen his, that you wouldn't, <laughs> sorry, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you wouldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time, the chestnuts in the jug went round and round. By and by, they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow, and from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice, and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. Just as sketchy then as now. But they were grateful, happy and pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge's, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. I'm going to take a quick breather there. Um just to check up on stuff and have a sip of tea because that's a lot of talking um mm. oh goodness let me take a little quick sip let me just check on things making sure that everybody's doing stuff excellent looks like everything's very good
Okay. Um, I'm also going to pause at this point um, really quick from the story just to share a couple of bits that I think run very similar from this story and A Child's Christmas in Wales, which uh, some of you might be familiar with from my video or from elsewhere, but some of you might not be. So I'm going to just read a quick couple of bits that I think are uh, especially relevant when it comes to the sort of descriptions that Dickens has and the description, uh, descriptions that Dylan Thomas has. So for instance, um, uh, he's talking about um, food at one particular point and he's talking about um, the, uh, oh, where did it go? I've lost my place, this is terrible. Okay, here we go. This is the, um, the food. Uh, and it sort of reminds me of this big catalog at the beginning of, of Scrooge's tale uh, that uh, when he's describing Christmas morning in the grocers and things like that. Uh, it's just this little, little list of uh, hard-boiled toffee, fudge and all sorts, crunches, cracknels, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter Welsh for the Welsh, which I love as a, uh, as, as a bit of just f so much food that is being described, and then later uh, when they're talking about uh, the actual Christmas dinner. Um... Shoot. This is... This is just com just absolutely compelling, uh, compelling content, Liz. Good job. Um... I've missed it, but I was going to do the other bit. <laughs> oh yeah, compelling content, Liz. Um, but I was talking about, um, th they're talking about singing in the, in the Cratchit household, and I always like to think of this particular passage as well, which is, always on Christmas night there was music, an uncle played the fiddle, a cousin chang cherry ripe, and another uncle sang Drake's drum. It was very warm in the little house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death and another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again. And uh, earlier still, there's a bit involving uh, telling, um, telling stories. And this is something that I think people don't talk about when you talk about uh, a Christmas carol being a ghost story of christmas they used to actually tell ghost stories at christmas this was a tradition so uh in, D in dylan thomas's story there's a bit that says bring out the tall tales now that we told by the fire as the gaslight bubbled like a diver ghost wooed like owls in the long night when i dared not look over my shoulder animals lurked in the cubby hole under the stairs where the gas meter ticked and i remember that we went singing carols once when there wasn't the shaving of the moon to light the flying streets and then he goes on to tell a story about a a creepy encounter they had at one dark house and uh, I just love that these these little moments that in A Christmas Carol and in A Child's Christmas in Wales there are all of these little moments of celebration that in some way or other are not necessarily codified in the sort of Christmas experience um, the same way that we might imagine that they would be they're not directly speaking traditions uh, in the sense of Christmas is Christmas regardless, but the fact that they are generally uh, sort of universal is actually something we can largely credit to Dickens. He, by virtue of his upbringing, his personal interest in Christmas, and his very popular publications and performances of A Christmas Carol, sort of cemented in uh, sort of Western English especially understanding of Christmas a lot of the things that were happening at the time, but may have died out without this influence and this putting down in writing the way that Dickens did. Um, Christmas celebrations were very different in the 18th century and prior to that, and I'm sure that this is a song that many of you have heard over and over again, but I just like to make that little observation. It is a lot of fun to, uh, it's a lot of fun to think about. So uh, to quote one more uh, from A Child's Christmas in Wales, before we move on, uh, one of my absolute favorites passages and something that I quote I'd say every Christmas is um, Auntie Hannah laced her tea with rum because it was only once a year. It's just a little dash. 
in honor of the season. So, you know. Cheers. Let us continue. All right, so we've left the Cratchits, and now we are moving on to other things. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires and kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner with hot plates baking through and through before the fire and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out cold and darkness. There all of the children of the house were running about in the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and to be the first to greet them. Here again were the shadows on the window blind of guests assembling, and there was a group of handsome girls, all, hooded, all hooded and fur booted, and all chattering at once, tripping lightly off to some neighbor's house, where woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches as they knew it, in a glow. But if you, but if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there instead of every house expecting company, piling up its fires half chimney high. Blessings on it, how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand and bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplighter who ran on before, dotting the dusky street with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though little kenned the lamplighter that he had any company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wheresoever it listed, or would have done but for the frost that held it prisoner, and nothing grew but moss and firs and coarse rank grass, down in the west setting sun had left the streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye and frowning lower, lower, lower yet was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. Where A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirit. But they know me. See. A light shone from a window of a hut and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled around the glowing fire. An old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in holiday attire. The old man, with a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigor sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and passing upon the moor, sped whither, not to see, to see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind him, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, some league or so from shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed, the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm birds, born of the wind, one might suppose, as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here, two men who watched the light had made a fire, and, through, and that, that through that loophole in the thick stone wall shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song like, that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on, until, being far away, he, he, as he told Scrooge from any shore, they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations, but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day, with homeward hopes belonging to it. 
and every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for another on that day than on any day of the year, and had shared to some extent in its festivities, and had remembered though he cared for at a dis and sorry, and had remembered those he cared for at a distance, and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while listening to the moaning of the wind and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss whose depths were as secret, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing, smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Excuse me, I'm just going to take another sip. Ha! laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha 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 ha! If you should happen by any unlikely chance... To know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head, twisting his face in the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he and their assembled friends, being not a bit behind hand, roared out lustily. <laughs> he said that Scrooge. He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless these women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, ripe little mouth, that seemed to be made to be kissed, as no doubt it was. All kinds of little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you have always told me so. Well, what of it, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't, he doesn't do, it doesn't do him any good with, sorry. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come to dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. My apologies. The dog has come into the frame, and uh, I think is eagerly looking for uh, food on the ground that we may have dropped by earlier. But it's okay. Yes, it is. What a good dog. She's just burying herself under my chair at this point. This is very strange. Oh, did you find something? Yes, okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to continue. You're a very good girl, but that tea is not for you. If for no other reason than it has rum in it now. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have a, uh, be competent judges, because they just had dinner. And with the dessert upon the table, they were clustered around the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't had I haven't got great faith in these new housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that he was a bachelor and a wretched outcast who had no right to express opinions on such a subject. Incidentally, uh, the description heretofore, uh, sorry, uh, the going forward of a um, one of the of the sister that he has his eye on. She is only ever referred to as the plump sister, and I find that to be extremely annoying. So whenever the plump sister is mentioned, I'm going to call her Betsy, because that's the name of one of the adaptations. And I can't stand this notion of the plump sister as being a defining characteristic. So we're just going to move on with that. Whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, Betsy, in the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. 
Do go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He is such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though, the, though Betsy tried hard to do so with aromatic vinegar, uh, his example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us, as I think, is that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter companions that he could find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or in his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he likes, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If, on if it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at this notion of shaking Scrooge. But being thoroughly good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so much as that they laughed, he encouraged them in their merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family and knew what they were about. When they sung a glee or a catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, would growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp and played, among the other tunes, a simple little air, a mere nothing, you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more and thought that if he could have listened to it often years ago, he would have cultivated the kindnesses for life that, for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton's spade that had buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the entire evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop, first there was a game at Blind Man's Buff. Of course there was. And I had no more believe and I had and I no more believe that Topper was really blind than I believe that he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is, is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way that he went after Betsy in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself against the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where Betsy was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did on purpose, or if you had made, he would have made a faint endeavor to seize you, which you would have been, <laughs> sorry, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of Betsy. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and really, and it really it was not. But when at last he caught her, when, in spite of all of her silken rustlings and her rapid flutterings past him, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape. Then his conduct was the most exorable, for he is pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress and further assure him of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger and, certain, and a certain chain about her neck, was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when, in another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Topper's such a perv. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, it, I love it and it's very sweet, but at the same time, like... Yeah, Topper's a big perv. <laughs> Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's buff party and was made comfortable in a large chair and footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, where, she was very great and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sisters hollow, though they were very sharp girls too, as I could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for, wholly forgetting the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice that his voice made no sound in their ears, he sometimes came out with his guess, quite loud, and very often guessed right, too, for the sharpest needle, best white chapel warranted to not cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. <laughs> Sorry, that's my phone yelling at me. Um... But I also think that this is funny because I think Whitechapel needles are referring to sewing needles that won't cut thread in the eye of the needle. But somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that front. Who is your cuckoo? Yeah, good scriptures. 
The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the end, but this the spirit could not but this the spirit said could not be done. Here is a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, it's like twenty questions, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what, he only answering of their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and walked about the streets and wasn't made a show of and wasn't led by anybody, didn't live in a menagerie and that was never killed in a market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up, to, get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister, following into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out. I'm sorry, Betsy. <laughs> yeah, too late. Reading too fast. Betsy cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? said Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge. And it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, although some objected that the reply to is it a bear ought to have been yes, inasmuch as the answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. I love that bear having a different definition now makes that a particularly funny line. <laughs> you can imagine Scrooge as a bear. He, had given us, he has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, the rest of the party cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, wherever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nevertheless. To Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man had his little brief authority, had, where ma vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught, taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge has it, had his doubts of this, because Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of the time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left a children's twelfth night party, when, by the way, approximately January the 6th, in case you didn't know, a uh, twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was grey. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, said Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe, but I see something strange and, and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it, is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at his feet, clutched upon his outer garment. Oh man, look here, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels may have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacingly. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade through all the mysteries of wonderful creation has monsters half so horrible and dread. 
Scrooge started back, appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say that they were fine children, but the words choked themselves, rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them, and they cling to me appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both in all of their degree, but by most of all beware this boy, for on his brow I see that written which is doom unless the writing be erased. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Slander those who tell it ye. Admit it for your factious purposes and make it worse and bide the end. Have they no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Ooh, spooky. Um, all right, that is my personal favorite passage of this entire story, is uh, the... Uh, is, is um, the conversation with uh, Fred and his uh, party followed by the observation of the children ignorance and want. Personally, the phrase, uh, this boy is ignorance, uh, beware most of the boy, for I see on his forehead written that which is doom, uh, and uh, all of the rest. It's It sticks in my mind in a way that I think is really special about literature. That line really does say to me absolutely some very very true things about uh, what is is one of the major perpetuators of want and uh, inequality and insecurity in this world. And so it, it, it speaks to me very, very directly and I think is very important to think about is that it's not just that people are hungry, it's that there are people who are actively negligent who cause that hunger and that suffering. And it's a very interesting thing that Charles Dickens is trying to open our eyes to and it is, I think, a very strong image, and it very makes it very much makes me sad when it is taken out of adaptations because I do think that it is one of the more pow powerful visuals that exists in the story. Um, I can understand why they do in some adaptations that maybe are not suitable for children, for instance, the Muppet Christmas Carol version. But regardless, um, anyways, we're going to take a little break, and when we come back, uh, V from Snappy Dragon will be reading Stave Four. And I'll be joining her in a Zoom call. So uh, hopefully you all get to enjoy that. And uh, in the meantime, take a quick break. We'll build up the fire again and we'll get everybody going again. Thank you so much for joining us so far. When we get back, I'll also update you all on how much we've raised so far, which I'm really excited to find out. So uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Uh, tell me, have they sold the prize turkey that was hanging there, not the little turkey, the big one? Well, the one as big as me? Yes. <laughs> Delightful boy. Uh, uh, yes, my buck, the one as big as you. It's hanging there still. Is it? Very well, then go and buy it. Whoa, cur. Uh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm in earnest. Tell the butcher to bring it here and I'll give him the name of the party he has to send it to. Come back with the butcher and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. <laughs> An enchanting boy. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. That's what I'll do. He'll never dream where it came from. <laughs> now, let me see. I must have a label. Label, 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 label. 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 <laughs> it's, it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. <laughs> Mr. Robert Cratchit, 2 Porter Street, Camden Town. That's you, Robert. These traces no one else I know of. I think I know who sent it. Who? Who? Mr. Scrooge. Oh, dear, oh dear, whatever made you think it might be him? I don't know. I just think it. What would make Mr. Scrooge take such leave of his senses suddenly? Christmas?
Ebenezer. Fred, is it too late to accept your invitation to dinner? Too late? I'm delighted, delighted. My dear, look who it is. Can you forgive a pig-headed old fool for having no eyes to see with, no ears to hear with? Oh, Hatchet, you're late. Sir. What do you mean by coming in here this time of day? Hmm? I'm very sorry, sir. I, I am behind my time, sir. <laughs> you are indeed. Step this way, Mr. Cratchit, please. It's only once a year, sir. It won't be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. <laughs> I'm sure you were. Well, we won't beat about the bush, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. Which leaves me no alternative but to raise your salary. <laughs> I haven't taken leave of my senses, Bob. I've come to them. From now on, I want to try to help you to raise that family of yours. If you'll let me. Well, we'll, we'll talk it over later, Bob, over a, over a bowl of hot punch. Hmm? Yeah. Meanwhile, you, you just go and put some more coal in that fire. You go straight out and buy a new coal scuttle. Isn't you do that before you dot another I, Bob Cratchit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't deserve to be so happy. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I just can't. 
can't help it. <laughs> Scrooge was better than his word. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city ever knew, or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. And to tiny Tim, who lived and got well again, he became a second father. Uncle Scrooge! And it was always said that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. and hellfire. All right, I think this is working. Somebody's going to tell me in a, somebody's gonna tell me in a moment. Oh, there we go. Hello. So usually an important question for the chat, where is everybody, what time is it, where you are, and what are you drinking? Um, it is. 4 p.m. in my corner of the universe. It is cloudy and rainy outside, and I am drinking white tea with rose and mint and lavender and lots of other wonderful stuff. something not working. I can't hear you and I also, I can't see you. Oh, there we go. You're back. Okay. Um, okay, apparently this camera's turning itself off like every five minutes. That's annoying. Curses. We're gonna take a second and fix that. Okay. Apologies, we're about to lose my video. <laughs> Oh, the joys of tech. Yes. Uh, 
okay. I think I've solved the problem. Let's see if this makes it better. I was trying to, no, I think I fixed it. I was trying to figure out why is it shutting off every three minutes? Oh, because this is not like a camera feed. This is a mirror of the camera's display and the display was set to auto off every three minutes and now it's set to every 30. So we should be able to keep me around for 30 minutes or so. I apologize to all the good people for the technical difficulties. Yeah, we're doing okay. Everything's just very weird. Rosie. This is what happens when I try to do a live stream with insufficient preparation on my Liz part. Ha Liz has been great. Liz has been Liz absolutely amazing. Oh, but uh, I am chaos. I am the chaos. It is me. Speaking of which, um, I think that my stream oh. has actually uh, frozen because I've got oh, it on dear. my headphones and it's not playing curses. Oof. Curses indeed. All right. We're not gonna get any cookies. All right. Sorry, we're just gonna be... Yeah, it's not responding at all. Hang on, I'm gonna have to quit and start again. Ooh. Okay.